Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Yulia Zhoja. I'm with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities, and I'm joined by my colleagues. Giselle Donnelly, I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And Dalibor Rohaj, also with AI. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. If you enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Today, we are joined by my former colleague, Dr. Heiko Biel, who is the head of the Department of Military Sociology at the German Armed Forces Center for military sociology and history and who I've had the pleasure of working with basically before I moved to the United States. And back then I decided or I wanted to work there um, because of Heiko's link to strategic culture. I did my PhD in strategic culture and tried to find out why and under what circumstances strategic culture or strategic cultures change. And so here's a one million dollars question for you to get you started Heiko and that is tell us about German strategic culture and whether that is changing uh, in current circumstances. Yeah, hello everyone and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, podcast and I have the opportunity to, to talk about our, our work. Well, it's really the one million dollar question, uh, how is Germany's strategic culture changing? I mean, the invasion of the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year was really an external shock, not only for Germany, but especially for Germany, and this had an impact on strategic culture. And some things or some aspects, some dimensions of Germany's strategic culture have changed over the last year, and others have not. And I think we can go into details about that. Um, but let me start with one observation I would like to add. And it's not the first that comes to your mind, but when you see that Germany has always tried to find a balance between its transatlantic ties to the US and to the UK and NATO. And on the other hand, to, to have close ties with France, you can see over the last year that the ties with the US, the transatlantic exchange and the orientation towards the US is becoming more and more relevant again, like in the Cold War. And this is really a change in strategic culture over the last year. And I would say that the relationship with France, and especially in the field of security and defense policy, the, the ties to, to, to French um, in cooperation with France is not that strong as it was some years ago. We are aware, or Germany's, uh, Germany is aware of this situation and tries to tighten these ties again, but it's not that easy. So I would say that's a very important uh, change over the last year that the relationship to the U.S. and uh, to NATO is becoming much more important than it was in the in the last decades. So that's that's very interesting because that, that touches on, I suppose, one dimension of of Julia's question: this sort of tension between Atlanticism and EU-centric view of of world affairs. And I wonder, first of all, whether that is susceptible of, of, of changing, especially if, if Trump returns to office in 2025, because we obviously had the experience with the Trump presidency. And, and I remember Chancellor Merkel being very insistent on how Europeans needed to take their destiny into their own hands. But it struck me that that approach was very heavy on rhetoric and relatively poor on actual substance. So if you have any sort of, you know, anything that you sort of anticipate that might happen, that would be useful. But, but there are also other dimensions of, of, of the question that I think are worth addressing. One is the relationship towards hard power and how you know German public and also people in the armed forces sort of see this. What, what attitudes do they have about you know Germany building hard power and and and, and possibly possibly using it? And then finally, how has Germany's thinking, if there is such a thing, changed uh, in terms of its navigating a sort of globalized world in which it was long assumed that economic ties and economic integration was a way of sort of diffusing conflict and, 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 and bringing oneself closer to potential adversaries and, and, and making sure that we trade rather than fight each other. So there were some heavy blows that that mindset has received over the past couple of years, but, but I'm not sure there has been a dramatic shift in actual policy. I mean, setting aside the issue of energy. 
let me start with, with a remark on the relations with, with the U.S. and also with the change from Trump to Biden. I mean, we have now really the chance that with Biden, there's the most pro-European and most transatlantic president in the White House, I would guess, since the elder Bush. And he has a very good understanding of the European situation. And yeah, of course, that's an opportunity for, for Germany and for the Europeans, but nobody knows for how long. And what I referred to was not only change of, of actual political leaders or political options, but also in the public opinion. We could see in our polls that reliance on the U.S. has risen sharply after the invasion of uh, Ukraine. But that's a remark. The core of your question was about um, hard power and, and the German attitude towards hard power, which is also the core of any concept of strategic cultures. And I would say, was there a change in how, or how is the situation today or how was it before the invasion? There are a lot of misunderstandings regarding the German attitude to hard power. It's, it's not the case that the Germans don't avoid the use of, of military power as such, but the, the use or the, the support for the use of military power depends always on the aim, on the political goals that you have. Look at the Cold War. Germany was divided, obviously, but was also highly militarized. So in West Germany, and East Germany too, we had a very strong armed forces together with the partners and it was one of the most militarized countries uh, worldwide. So, and we had more or less a, a broad support from society for this kind of deterrence, for this kind of strong armed forces. This changed with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with the end of the Cold War because Germany and the Germans had reservations about interventions and missions abroad. That was not in the mindset of the, of the German public, not in the mindset of the German politicians, and obviously not in the mindset of a lot of German soldiers. So there were a lot of reservations. And the image that is now nowadays after, after decades of missions abroad is the Germans are participating but whatever that part means, not in the full-fledged spectrum. And that is true for, for all the kind of interventions in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, or in Africa, and Mali, alongside our French partners. But when it now goes back to the defense, and the collective defense, I would say that the support of the German public, the support also of the German political actors, it's much stronger. And if you look into the, the, the armed forces, there's still a mindset for this kind of, we are an army for defense, for collective defense, together with our neighbors and partners. And it is much more to the, to the German military culture or DNA as the intervention. So when you look to this use of military power aspect, I would say that's not so much change in the mindset or in the culture of, of, of Germany. But the circumstances are completely different uh, from 10 years ago with this Afghanistan mission uh, is the most important task for the German armed forces. So now you have really a situation where you can reconcile the mindset uh, of the German public, uh, military and political elites with the task in front of us. I wonder if you could give us your views on the relationship between German strategic culture and American strategic culture. And these are obviously have been since World War II deeply intertwined. And it's not unreasonable to look at the changes, uh, particularly in the last several decades, in American attitudes toward the use of hard power and obviously in the wake of unhappy experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan and uncertainty about exactly how to deal with the Russo-Ukrainian war, which we see sort of being played out. Well, we certainly saw it earlier this year in the negotiations about transferring tanks to Ukraine and now in, in terms of longer range strike systems. So I, I'd just be interested in your take on how the interactive dynamic between Americans' approach to use of military power and Germany's approach to their those remain intertwined? Is there sort of a, you know, this is too simplistic, but, but 
for clarity, I'll say sort of, you know, leader follower sort of dynamic or, or I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, I'd be interested in your view. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. But but leader follower, I think it's not that wrong because, first of all, I have to rely to the obvious and that's a huge difference in resources and means and power that, that you have. And it goes along with a different mindset because as you said, for example, the delivery of German tanks to Ukraine, which finally happened, only happened when others also came around uh, and also made the same decision. And especially uh, Germany was oriented towards what is uh, the decision in Washington. And uh, some even said that Chancellor Scholz had forced President Biden into that decision. I don't think that's that's correct or that's the right way to see this thing. But nevertheless, I would say multilateralism is very deep ingrained into the German strategic culture. And never, never alone is one lesson of German history. We, we want to be a reliable partner. We want to be a partner with the West. And as I mentioned before, when we uh, look to the uh, to the West uh, nowadays, we especially look at what happens in the US and what happens in Washington. So these are uh, two aspects. Let me perhaps add another aspect because the the, the world view of the US, as I understand, I'm not no expert in this, but it's it's real global. You know that is. They have a global approach. And um, in Germany, we have this global approach and kind of economic issues and economic uh, trade and so on, but not in security affairs. We are very much focused on, on, on Europe and Europe surroundings and borders, Mediterranean perhaps, near and Middle East and so on. But in the end, we are not an, an, a global actor like the US is. We are much more a European actor. That whole Weltmark thing didn't work out too well. <laughs> well, that's one aspect. And let me go back to the other aspect. That is the worldview, which kind of power could you use and which kind of power should you use and should you have? And in, in the US, you have this balance of economic power, and military power, political power, soft power, hard power, and so on. In Germany, as was already mentioned before, Four, we had this world for you that uh, if you are trading with others and you have, if you have good economic relationships, I think everybody relationships are improving in every regard. And obviously, that's not true as the relationship to Russia has taught us because it was, I mean, the, 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 the idea behind the energy dependent with Russia was not that wrong because it said, we are dependent on you, Russia delivers us natural gas. And on the other side, we put a lot of money to Russia and stabilize the economy and society in the long run and so on. And by this kind of trade, we have a relationship and we soften our tensions and so on. Obviously, this went wrong and was a wrong idea. And now we are not only dependent of energy, we are also dependent as a globalized economy on trade with others. China in the background for most, our car industry sells a lot of cars there and so on. So I think what will change in, in Germany over the next few years is how we can still be globalized in, in economic terms on the one hand, and not naive and on security issues on the other hand. And well, it's, it's an ongoing debate and until now that there's not really a solution to be seen, but it's, it's really an urgent debate that we have to, to have. It strikes me that there is another element of, of, of this, which is much more prominent in Germany and on the European continent than, than in the United States, which is the public's understanding that Climate change and tackling climate change is a sort of central concern that requires multilateral action and therefore we have to get along with the likes of China and Russia and, 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 and others. Do you have the sense that the centrality of, of, of the climate question in any way sort of constrains political choices or makes people squeamish about policies that would be justified on, on security grounds but, but which are kind of taken off the table because of the need for us to get along with others to tackle climate change and other kind of global questions? Well, the, the, the question of climate change is always there. If I look just at society and public debate, I would say that 
climate change uh, is always there as an urgent issue, but not a lot of arises and urgency coming around. And that's the opposite to these uh, events like the war in, in Ukraine or now the, the terrorist attacks in, in Israel or on Israel. We see from our uh, public opinion poll over the last years that climate change is also one of the most important uh, threats to the German public. But nowadays we see other issues like inflation, like migration issues arising and um, have much higher visibility and much higher urgency. Therefore, I would say that uh, climate change is a, a topic for, for the long run. And uh, to do this, uh, what is, I mean, that's, that's obvious that you can't, solve this kind of problems and issues on your own. But if you look at Germany and the German debate, it's, well, it's really surprising how much unilateral measures are taken in Germany. And it's about the, the energy that we've really now quit nuclear energy. It's the same with some laws concerning a heating system in German houses. I won't bother you with all the details, but a lot of unrest and a lot of questions in German society are always, why do we take these measures and what impact do they have on a global scale? I mean, we're just one country. The idea behind this is perhaps to be a leader in technology and, and climate-friendly yeah, technology, but, but I'm not sure about this. But there's a lot of unrest in Germany now in the public about, this, about these issues and even the last elections on the, on the state level last weekend and even these election results showed that there's a lot of frustration in, in the German public also about this climate change issue. Let me also ask you about specifically the use of force. I know you guys are polling on this regularly, and if I'm looking back, there's rarely a case where a country, I mean, maybe in the European context there are a few more, but overall, um, Germany is just, uh, has been so reluctant and has been so squeamish about it. The whole debate about Afghanistan in Germany, do we have a war or not? The abstention um, in the Security Council in the context of Libya and the consequences thereof in the collective psyche of the German decision makers and elites have certainly left the impression that Germany did despite external shocks like uh, major wars, it remains extremely reluctant at the public level um, and, of course, the political one to use force too. So then let me ask you a very stark question. Now, one and a half years into the war, something that I'm sure Poland and others would like to ask, but uh, they cannot frame it so starkly. Are Germans ready to shoot Russians? I think it comes down to the question of that in the in the context of because it makes it even starker, right? The war is next door. It's not Afghanistan. Um, it's not Libya. That's even closer but really one or two countries away. And then we have the whole discussion, especially at the beginning of the war and before the full-scale invasion of Germany, having a special cultural um, sort of relationship with Russia that has been held against it. It's been visible, including in polls. So what do you see in the polls that you're conducting? Is there a change in, in this regard? Or do we have to tackle the same elements of in principle and even more so on European ground, G Germany remains extremely reluctant to use force. Several questions in one. I would like to start with the observation that we really saw in our last year's public opinion poll a dramatic shift. It was the most dramatic shift that we've seen ever. We are doing this, this poll now for decades since the mid-1990s. And even after 9-11 or other events, we didn't see this dramatic shift in some regards. In which regards now? Is Germany ready for war fighting? I would say that the idea behind the, the NATO and the collective defense is that it's not necessary to fight. This war would have a good deterrence and really a deterrence which uh, deterred the, the, the opponent and, and this must be reliable. And I think what we see from our public opinion polls now for years that it's not so much the public who has some doubts about a deterrence, collective defense, and so on. 
but more it's more in the public debate than the media. And well, one of our main key points with every public uh, report we, we publish on our polls is the public or the resistance or the hesitance in the, in the public is not as great as a lot of people think. So that's that's my first point. Nevertheless, you said the war is next door. My observation, that that's not based on data, but my observation is that the, the war is not really next door in the, in, in the public mind because it's now in, in the eastern part of Ukraine for one and a half year, more or less. You see, it's not that close to the border that a lot of Germans fear it will be immediately after the Russian attack. So there are some first signs of fatigue or some you are accustomed to the situations. There's not much change on, on the front line in Ukraine and so on. Other events are coming to the, or other issues are coming to the front lines, like, for example, uh, migration, inflation, now the, the terrorist attacks in Israel and so on. And, well, that's an observation I want to share with you. And the, the third part is where we have really seen a difference in last year, that is the, the public image of Russia. You must keep in mind that before the Russian invasion of uh, 2022, there was more or less, roughly spoken, a third of the German public who was very opposed uh, against Russia in the sense that they feared they, they might start a war again and so on. We had a third of the German public who was more or less indifferent, who said, well, we can make economy, do some trade with them, but they are not close friends. And up to a third of the German public said, well, they, they are our neighbors and we have a common mindset and so on. And uh, this third diminished over the last year. So we still have some uh, Russia or Putin friends in Germany and the media are always uh, interviewing them and are focused on them. But in the broader public, uh, they, they mostly vanished. So I would say that the German public is, is not naive on Russia on the contrary, they are now seen, Russia is now seen as an opponent, as an aggressor, as really a danger for European security. Wow. And that's the most dramatic shift that, that we have seen uh, over the last year. May I ask how you see this evolving through the future? Obviously, there's the immediate and pressing question of the Russo-Ukrainian war, but there's also the larger and longer term question of securing Central and Eastern Europe as the bulwark or the front lines, the Eastern Front, if you will, of the democratic West, which requires not just making sure that Ukraine is successful on the battlefield, but that there is a posture of deterrence across, you know, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, really that requires long-term investment, a different relationship, a different power relationship between the United States and European countries uh, individually and collectively. Is there a, a Zeitenwende that's going to be durable and last and not just be a one-time reaction to a shock, but a truly transformative, you know, we don't know exactly where this process is going to lead. We don't know where the United States is going to be precisely. But how much durability is there for what's going to be a longer war in Ukraine? And it's going to be, a, again, probably a decades long standoff with Russia. And that involves, you know, sort of solidifying Western liberalism in a kind of no man's land where it's been sort of you know, been up and down, but drifting since the, the triumph of the Cold War. That was a rather long and winding question, uh, but you can give a long and winding answer as a, as a result. Yeah, thank you very much. If you ask about the, the future in the long term or long run of this situation, I would say that our free development in free countries and regions is, is decisive. First of all, in Russia, what happens in Russia, you never know. With Brugoshin and so on, you could see that the situation might change over night. You never know. But, I mean, regardless of whether it's Putin or some lesser figure, yet the question is, has Russia revealed something of a more endurable Russian strategic culture in its actions? There Again, there may be different individuals who are running the show, but there'll be 
continuity. Exactly. I agree with you, but I'm not uh, no expert in Russian uh, culture. I want just to highlight development in Russia is decisive in the long run. Development in the U.S. is decisive in the long run. And what I elaborate a little bit on is development in Europe. And in this podcast, I already mentioned uh, several times before, perhaps we are going back to this posture of collective defense, deterrence, reliability, close partnerships with the U.S. and with our European partners and friends. But uh, there's one issue I would like to mention which is uh, missing compared to the Cold War. During the Cold War, and I grew up in the Cold War, and uh, even in the, in the school you were confronted with this kind of international aspect of international relations, there was a narrative behind this collective defense. And this was, we are the blue side, yeah? we are the democratic and freedom and and free trade. And on the other side of the border, of the German-German border, there's the red side, and this is communism, socialism, you name it, there's no freedom, and so on. And I think what's what's a little bit missing now, you mentioned it in your question, but is this narrative, and I mean narrative also by political elites to say, well, we are here a community of free democracies, we are accepting the sovereignty of others, we are closing together, in, in this effort and we want to stabilize our uh, our country we want to stabilize our alliance and defend it against potential or, or actual uh, foes and, and enemies and therefore I think to, to establish such a narrative is, is very very decisive and necessary to have this reliability in, in, the, in the long run and the other one is obviously Europeanization of defense because we will rely on the U.S. for some years to come, but it's necessary to have deterrence on our own and to have forces strong enough on our own to deter potential aggressors on, on the Eastern Front. I think this is a good note on which to end, and it keeps a, a question open that, or you opened it up, that we will have to keep tackling on this podcast and that that is exactly this narrative. To what extent is it developing, especially in Europe? And I think you're making a good point that it also very much depends on who is going to be in the White House um, in 2025. But certainly here on this podcast, we see overlap in threats and challenges that we will have in Europe to wrap our heads around it. Just this morning, I saw news in the context of, you know, NATO technical elements that NATO is now looking more at the border south of Europe and how to overlap conceptually threats and addressing threats from the south and from the east, that we shouldn't be separating them. That leads to, you know, the issue of narratives and ideology, where ideologically come attacks against the West from. And so thank you for opening that up and we'll leave it suspended until until the next time. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and having a chance here to discuss with you. Thank you very much. From me, Nuria Zorza, and my friends, Giselle Donnelly and Dal Burhaj. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. To stay up to date with the Eastern Front, please give us a follow on Twitter at Eastern Front Pod in one word and sign up for our newsletter through the link included in the show notes. You could find more episodes and additional content on our website, AEI.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye.